Thanks, Liz. Um, and I too would like to acknowledge that this is Wiradjuri land. It always was and always will be. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and I thank them for their amazing contribution to our um, beautiful country. Big thanks to the New South Wales DPI team, who I know have been putting huge amounts of work into these workshops right across New South Wales, and it's, a, it's certainly a pleasure to be here. Um, it's a bit cooler than Queensland, although we did get a frost the other morning, so um, it's, yeah, it's not, not terribly uh, different. Um, but really my experience with emergency animal diseases was pretty much theoretical until 2020 when ehrlichiosis was first detected in Australia. Um, and since that time I've been involved uh, through my role with AMRIC in both what that's meant from an on-ground perspective for the animals and the communities that we're working with, uh, but also then spending a lot of time uh, working with different governments and, and departments advocating the impact that that outbreak has had. Um, so, um, as Liz said, today I'll give you an overview of that. I'll also give you some background on AMRIC for those of you who aren't familiar, as well as the context that we're working in, um, and just talk about, I guess, some lessons and opportunities from that outbreak. Um, so AMRIC, as Liz mentioned, is a not-for-profit. We're based in Darwin, but we work nationally with remote communities right across Australia. Um, we were founded around 20 years ago by a group of vets and environmental health workers who were doing veterinary services independently but realised that a, a more coordinated approach would have greater impact. Um, and so from this foundation today, AMRIC exists to, to assist and to empower communities to meet their needs for companion animal management and health. Uh, and that's the health not only of the animals but also of their communities and ecosystems as well. Our vision is for healthy animals, healthy, proud communities. And so to accomplish this, our team of about 14 staff, our, our board and our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Advisory Committee work closely with our, our many and varied collaborating partners right across remote Australia. Um, these partners come from uh, right throughout the One Health sector. So we've got veterinary service provider partners, uh, we've got human health partners, and, and of course environmental health as well. And together, these efforts help to improve the health of the community animals, um, but also the health of the, the broader community, its amenity, um, the animals that live around the communities, the biodiversity as well. So AMRIC borrows from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives to take a really holistic view of health. And this health extends beyond the physical impacts to individuals, um, and recognises the importance of connections to things like land, sea, country, family, cultural practices and community. We recognise that for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, health tends to incorporate the physical, social, emotional, cultural and spiritual wellbeing of individuals right across their lives. However, there are lots of challenges to good health in remote Indigenous communities and most of these are well beyond the control of individuals. The World Health Organisation defines the social determinants of health as those factors which, in which a person is born, grows, works, lives and ages. And they include factors that shape the condition of our daily lives. These social determinants really affect us all in a variety of ways. They include things like income, education, employment, food security, housing, uh, social inclusion and access to affordable health services. Particularly for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, cultural determinants of health, which include things like access to traditional country, to ceremony, self-determination and kinship systems, also play a really important role in health and well-being. So these social and cultural determinants of health can have an important influence then on health equity. Um, and in fact, according to the Australian Burden of Disease Study, social determinants of health account for about 30% of the health gap between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and non-Indigenous Australians. So with complex interactions of social and cultural determinants of health that impact these communities, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary responses are required. For remote Indigenous communities, things like geography, climate, socioeconomics, culture and the legacies of colonisation are compounded by wide-scale overcrowding, by poor housing conditions, and ongoing injustices such as trauma and racism. For community residents, food security issues, lack of access to affordable, to affordable goods and services, 
limited educational and employment opportunities, all come together to mean that disadvantage and poverty are unfortunately very common. In remote communities in particular, these determinants compound and they result in statistics such as the highest rates of disadvantage, which is represented on this map by the, the darker colours, higher disease burdens and shorter life expectancies. The trouble with statistics though is that we all hear them so often, uh, they're distant, they, they're far away, they tend to lose their meaning and their gravitas. You know, I've been privileged to work with AMRIC for the last 10 years. I've, I've visited a lot of remote communities over that time. And for me, these statistics are cemented in the extraordinary and saddening frequency of sorry days or funerals for people who are often young, who have had their lives cut short and their opportunities diminished. So within this broader, quite heavy context for 7.30 on a Friday morning, uh, the health and management of remote community animals can seem pretty trivial. They're just camp dogs, aren't they? Uh, something that we hear very often. <laughs> um, but it's unfortunately a really common, often racially biased misconception. For dogs and cats, you see, are a really important part of communities and they play a versatile role. They can serve as loyal companions, as, as confidants. They can be hunting aids. They might be physical and spiritual protectors. Uh, for some, they're, they're vermin controllers. And for others, they might be a source of warmth, particularly in those desert communities where the temperatures drop. While they tend to be free roaming, this doesn't mean that they're not cared for. There's always an individual, uh, if not a family, or the community collectively looking out for them. For most remote Indigenous communities, dogs are also woven into the cultural fabric of that community. Um, they're part of the culture and the, and the law for that society. So they're often given skin names and, and that positions them within the kinship system, incorporating them uh, into the familial relationships of that community. So they might be then considered a grandmother or a niece in that kinship system. Uh, for some, uh, for, for people, they're, they're totemic species, so they might be someone's totem within that cultural, uh, the culture of that community. And this bestows upon that person particular cultural obligations in terms of the responsibility and care for that species. Uh, and in other communities, dogs are also woven into the dreaming stories of that particular region. So there, there are a number of dog sites across Australia where dogs feature in, in the origin stories for the, the landscape, the lands, its inhabitants and their interactions. So the relationships between companion animals and people in remote communities are really complex and multi-layered, um, well beyond the depths of anything I could ever expect to understand, but certainly enough to recognise that it goes far beyond the traditional um, pet relationship that we tend to have in Western society. Um, and these relationships really do um, impact the health of the, the people, but they're also part of those social and cultural determinants of health too. Of course, Australia is a very, very big country. We have a lot of remote regions. Uh, and so the remote and very remote regions on this map are the background cream and yellow colours. And of course, in these areas, as I'm sure it is around here as well, vet services can be really hard to come by. Um, the dots on this map represent discrete Indigenous communities as represented by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. And so for many remote communities, it's hundreds if not thousands of kilometres to the nearest vet clinic. If we take the Northern Territory, for example, there are five regions where there are permanent veterinary clinics within the NT. Um, and so that's a whole lot of country surrounding um, those regions that, that don't have that permanent access. And we see the, the distress, the shame, the anguish that this lack of access causes. Um, but we do see what this means for communities when they don't have access to veterinary services and their, their animals become overpopulated, they become ill, they become injured. We also know that any time there are close associations between animals and people, the risks of things like zoonotic diseases increases. And of course, unmanaged companion animal populations can have really a strong impacts on local biodiversity where they're overpopulated. 
So here's a nice breakfast shot, lucky we're all vets. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> recognising that animal health and management impacts on community... Sorry guys, at the back who are not vets, I've just realised. Um, recognising that animal health and management impacts on community health and wellbeing. For the most part, local governments and Aboriginal organisations do try to provide veterinary services for their communities and they do that by contracting in vet visiting veterinary service providers. Um, some regions also utilise local environmental health or animal management staff to, to do things like distribute antiparasitics between veterinary visits and be able to be that conduit between the vet and the community. The resourcing for these services though is, is really limited. Most communities are lucky to receive a week-long visit twice a year if they're really lucky, um, often it's once. Um, and so with limited access to animal health services, it's no wonder that we start to see conditions like this, especially given that many remote regions are in climates that are really conducive to parasite populations. So AMRIC's One Health approach recognises the inextricable links between human, animal and environmental health and wellbeing. And by assisting communities to improve the health and management of their dogs and cats, uh, we're not only improving the health and welfare of those animals, but also reducing risks to the health of people from both physical and mental health risks, um, as well as reducing threats to local, local ecosystems. Our approach has been honed over the last 20 years. Um, we were established in 2003. And so at its core, we focus on understanding and respecting people's connections to their animals, recognising that that can be different across cultures. Um, and we recognise that these relationships can impact the physical, social and emotional wellbeing of both people and animals. We work with all stakeholders and try to work really collaboratively to co-design and implement culturally appropriate and culturally safe programs that meet the needs of the community as a whole. We emphasise the importance of building trust and valuing relationships, which is something that I'm sure that you guys are all doing, um, but certainly it can't be understated in, um, overstated rather, in remote communities. We also recognise that dogs and cats are woven into the fabric of community culture and that the health and treatment of animals is intrinsically linked to the health and wellbeing of communities. Our three core pillars of work include animal management services, strengthening capacity and knowledge, and One Health impact. Uh, and so really providing culturally safe and contextually appropriate veterinary and animal health services has been at the core of AMRIC's work uh, since we've existed. So to do this, we work in partnership with local governments, with environmental health organisations and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations, with universities, with state and federal governments, uh, with other not-for-profits and, of course, our veterinary teams. We are able to enhance the outcomes of our veterinary programs through our, our incredibly dedicated volunteer veterinarians and vet nurses who join our veterinary service providers and work to assist their outcomes that they're able to deliver. Our animal management services also include um, the, the direct delivery of these veterinary services, but then also providing some strategic advice around how local governments and, and remote communities can get the best bang for their limited resources that they have to put into these sort of programs. Um, so at the heart of it, our animal health programs certainly focus on parasite prevention. So all of our programs involve community-wide broad spectrum antiparasitic delivery. We're of course working in these regions where it's hot and it's humid and parasites like to thrive. Um, so the parasites can actually be a significant population limiter in a lot of these communities. Um, just as we are providing the antiparasitics through the delivery of our programs, we also recognise that having ongoing access to effective and affordable animal health products is really critical for communities to be able to be empowered to improve the health of their own animals. And so one of the other things that we're doing is working with the pharmaceutical companies, nurturing those relationships, um, encouraging them to get on board so that we can ensure that community stores are then stocking effective and affordable antiparasitic products um, that are easy to use, that are within the budgets of the community residents. Population control, of course, is another major aspect of our animal health programs. Um, with any large free roaming animal population, particularly companion animals, we see increased spread of infectious diseases. Um, this of course can impact the health of the animals but also the people. 
Um, they also have lots of other negative impacts and nuisance impacts. Um, anyone who's, who's stayed in a remote community can attest to the noise at night of dogs barking and fighting and mating. Um, and it really does disrupt your sleep. And so for residents who are living in remote communities year round, the impact that that has, I think, is really significant. You know, particularly for people who are doing their best to participate in the workforce or at school, uh, when they're being uh, woken up consistently throughout the night by these animals and their noises um, is a major frustration. Um, dogs then also do things like knocking over bins and spreading feces and waste everywhere. Um, the, the cats, of course, are free roaming and so they, they're heading out into the neighbouring bush and, and eating all the local wildlife. Um, so these animals really do have a significant impact beyond the animals themselves. And so population control, predominantly through surgical dissexing, um, is, is a big focus of our work. That, of course, means we need to take all of our gear um, and set up field hospitals because it's very rare that a community has a dedicated veterinary room. There are one or two, um, but usually we're, we're given this, the hall or the spare room here or there. We're lucky if we've got aircon. Um, and in, in some circumstances in the smaller communities, we're lucky if we're even in an enclosed room. So um, there's a lot of work that goes into setting up those, those field hospitals, but also then uh, working with the various veterinary boards to make sure that they're happy with the setup that we're delivering. Um, and of course, oh, one too many. In addition to the population control, um, of course, animals get injured or are ill when we're there and also between visits when we're there. So our programs include treatments and medication to make sure that we're addressing any animal welfare concerns that we encounter. So as part of that, making sure that communities are effectively using their limited resources, we offer strategic animal management advice to local governments and Aboriginal corporations. Um, one of the examples of this is our Queensland Needs Assessment, which we're running at the moment with the 16 local governments in Queensland that are designated as Indigenous local governments. Um, and so part of this service is we're working with the, the animal management workers in each of these communities who are employed by the local government. We're training them in basic um, animal identification skills, signalment, health assessments. We're also training them in the, the provision and administration of antiparasitic treatments. Um, AMRIC has developed an app, which I'll touch on later, which allows us to collect companion animal uh, data. So the health and condition and numbers of those animals in the community are, is then recorded. And by analysing that data at a community scale, we're then able to look at things like what the reproductive control is in that community, um, you know, what the, the general health trends of the animals are, and what sort of services are required to get to the target levels of reproductive control or animal health. Uh, and that allows local governments to then better plan their resources to, to make sure that they're using those limited resources as wisely as possible um, and making sure that the communities themselves are benefiting as much as they possibly can. And so strengthening capacity and knowledge is certainly a big part of that Queensland Needs Assessment, but it's, we, we have a much broader program dedicated to that. Um, we've for a long time recognised that you know, going in and delivering veterinary services is not enough. Uh, we need to be bringing communities along on that journey, empowering communities to be involved in that process as well. Um, and so we have a range of educational and training resources that we've developed over time uh, that cater to a, a huge range of ages from you know, pre-school ages right through to adults. Um, and those resources are culturally and contextually relevant, which is something that I think is, is so critical. Uh, you know, we're working in communities where English is often a fourth or fifth language and certainly not spoken in the home. We're working in communities where educational levels are often quite limited. And so making sure that our resources are uh, tailored to those needs, um, that we're, we're using appropriate language. Wherever possible, we actually translate our resources into local languages um, so that they're more readily accessible by community members. Um, but really, it's all about building the, the knowledge and skills of community members themselves so that vets can come in and deliver the technical service on a visiting basis, but it's the community who can continue to manage the health of their animals over time. Uh, I think I've covered this one pretty much, but we really do believe that education helps to reinforce the work of the vet program and certainly um, whenever we're delivering veterinary services we always try to run a parallel education program 
We think, host things like community barbecues and, and fun events to get everyone excited about the vet visit, get word of mouth happening out among the community. Um, you know, go to the school, do lots of lessons with the kids, things like staying safe around, uh, staying safe around dogs, what to do if a dog charges at you, um, through to you know, hand hygiene and, and what animals need in terms of care as well. Um, and so through all these different avenues of conversation that we're having within the community, we have really strong engagement. We always make sure also that when we're delivering our services, we're working alongside local community members. So whether that's Indigenous rangers, whether that's animal management workers or environmental health workers, having a local community member who knows the community, who knows the animal population, can speak the local language and understands the local cultural uh, and political situation within that community, it really means that our services are able to be more culturally safe, more contextually appropriate um, and better benefit that community. Um, so over the last 20 years, AMRIC and our partners have developed a huge amount of anecdotal information and evidence around particularly the One Health impacts of companion animals in communities. However, um, not a lot of this anecdote has been captured and published and that's a real shame. Uh, because certainly policies should be evidence-based and we need to be making sure that what we know and what we see is informing those policies and therefore funding decisions going forward. So our third pillar therefore of work is around evidencing the One Health impacts of the work that we're doing. Um, and so to do that, we work in partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities to identify their, their priorities and questions around the One Health impacts that they see in their own communities but then also with the research network. So um, both researchers within Australia and internationally, working with them to help guide them around culturally appropriate and empowering research projects that don't just take data and leave, um, that actually build the capacity of communities, uh, but that are also helping to evidence these One Health priorities. Um, we, we, we really try to do this as collaborati collaboratively as possible um, and we, I think at the moment we've probably got about seven different applications going with different researchers and different communities um, looking at a range of topics from you know, physical risks through to the, the meaning of animals in communities. Um, these are all the things that I think we need to get better at evidencing so that we can then justify why these, these services need to continue to happen when it comes down to funding decisions. Um, another big aspect of that One Health Impact work is in advocating the need and so you know my presence here today is part of that advocacy work but we're also members of lots of different committees uh, and, and groups and we work to highlight the, the need that exists in remote communities, the benefits that these services can have um, and just make sure really that the, the One Health Impacts are recognised. So enough about AMRIC. Um, we're going to jump over to ehrlichiosis now. So hopefully you've all well and truly by now heard of ehrlichiosis, that it came to Australia or was first detected at least in 2020. Um, this is a video that we developed at, um, pretty close after finding out that ehrlichiosis was in Australia. We've since had it translated into seven different local languages. Um, so from Creole through to uh, Pitjantjara, through to um, Walpuri and, and Yolnu. Um, and really, this, it's not just about ehrlichiosis, we've included anaplasma and babesia in this, and this is just a, a snippet from that video, the, the total video is about five minutes. Dog ticks can cause big problems for dogs. One of these problems are sicknesses that the ticks can spread from dog to dog. Animal doctors are known as vets. Vets call these tick sicknesses tick born diseases. What they mean by born is the disease is being carried by the tick. Some of the names of these diseases are anaplasmosis, babesiosis, and a new disease for Australia called ehrlichiosis. Germs are what cause tick diseases. These germs live in the blood of dogs that already have tick born diseases. The tick is what spread these germs from dog to dog. Without treatment, tick-borne diseases can make dogs very sick or even kill them. Um, it's, um, it's been a really good resource and certainly widely shared on our social media page by lots of different groups. 
Um, and it, it really just the basics of tick-borne disease spread in dogs and what that can mean. Um, of course, Ehrlichia canis, you're right Liz, thank you, um, is a bacteria that, that is transmitted by the brown dog tick. Um, I guess you guys probably do have brown dog ticks here, I would think, yep. Um, and so it's, uh, I'm not going to go into any of the technical details. Peter Irwin and I have done different presentations and Peter's certainly done other presentations as well going into the technical side of E. canis. Um, but it is an intracellular bacteria that has really detrimental impacts. So prior to 2020, oh, there we go. Um, this was the global distribution or thought to be the global distribution of E. canis. And of course, in 2020, the disease was first detected in Australia. So, uh, there's a vet based at Kununurra, she's been there for many years, called Sarah Brett. And she is very used to seeing top end diseases like anaplasma and babesia, has seen them for decades. Uh, but she realised that there were dogs presenting to her clinic with more severe symptoms than what she was used to. So more severe bleeding disorders, with febrile illnesses, um, they had, you know, uh, corneal edema, they had enlarged spleens. There were lots more dogs dying than what she was used to as well. So fortunately she took some samples, sent them off down to Depot in Perth and I'm sure Depot probably worked with other state labs as well and it was determined that Ehrlichia canis was present in Australia. So following that original detection, the various jurisdictions then put a call out for surveillance samples to be collected. Um, and so, uh, particularly in remote regions, these samples were largely collected by private practitioners delivering community health services. And it was pretty quickly determined that Ecanus was right throughout the north of Western Australia, all through the Northern Territory, and even down into the APY lands in South Australia. And so, that was the status for a little while, um, throughout 2021 really. But in 2022, in early 2022, there was some cases found in uh, the northwest of Queensland, in the Gulf Country there, around Mount Isa. And subsequently, later in 2022, it was found throughout Cape York as well. It's uh, at this stage, I believe, the, the most southerly detection has been Townsville of dogs that have not travelled. Um, there have been cases detected in New South Wales, but these have all been dogs that have been brought from endemic areas at this point. So I think one of the things that, um, sort of depended who you talk to, whether it was surprising or not, but one of the things that was clear was that this disease was well and truly distributed by the time that we really started to pick it up. Um, but when you stop and think about it and start to look at the travel, particularly that remote community members are doing, often with their dogs, as it's just a cultural norm, um, it starts to become clear that diseases can spread quite quickly when they're assisted by human assisted movement. And so this is a really old map, 99 as you can see, but basically this was a study that asked people in remote communities to identify where, they're near, where they would normally go for banking services or um, you know, if there was uh, some sort of service that they couldn't access within their community, where they would go. And so you can see people are travelling really, really big distances um, from you know, the, the Nunanjara lands here in, in the, the southeast of Western Australia through to Alice Springs. That's probably a 1,200 kilometre run. Um, so people are travelling a long way and often they are travelling with their dogs. What this map <coughs> doesn't depict is travel for footy carnivals or for ceremony and kinship relationship obligations. So you start to overlay those things as well and you've got a really mobile population um, that's often bringing their animals with them. Certainly um, something to be aware of I think if rabies does ever serve up more of a threat. So back to Ecanus, uh, where will it end up? It's a good question. There's still a fair bit of um, question remaining around that, but the, the vector itself, the brown dog tick, um, is quite, quite uh, distributed throughout Australia. So it's a bit harder to see here, but the, the darker red on this map is based on the Department of Ag uh, map that was produced with the Lichiocosis resources um, last year or the year before. The lighter shading here is um, both two things. So it's, there's a, a new study from Barker and Barker that Boring and Ingelheim have picked up and they're using that on their Tick Check website. And that has detected brown dog ticks right through Southern Australia, right through Victoria and, and um, South Australia there. And then over in Western Australia, those lighter colours are just based on our anecdotal experience working in communities and recognising brown dog ticks there. So potentially, if E. canis is introduced to the tick populations anywhere on this map, um, E. canis in theory could establish. Of course, 
brown dog ticks love hot, humid conditions, so they're always going to be more prevalent in the north and the central parts of Australia. Um, but potentially we could start to see cases further and further south and certainly as people start to move their dogs more and more that's likely to be the case. So the disease itself um, is, is difficult to manage and difficult to diagnose because it can move through these different phases. So to be infected the dog has to be in, bitten by a tick carrying Ehrlichia canis. It's not dog, dog, to dog, dog to dog transmission directly. There has to be that vector involved. Um, and usually once they're bitten by that tick, two to four weeks later, they'll develop acute symptoms. Um, so this is often lethargy, anorexia, weight loss. Sometimes they'll develop corneal edema, and that's certainly what we saw in a lot of communities. People would say to us, what is this thing with the dogs and the blue eyes? Why have they all got blue eyes now? Um, and so that was a fair bit of a giveaway for us, that, that, that Ehrlichia canis was now present in that community as well. So at the acute phase, it can be responsive to treatment. The treatment is a 28 day long doxycycline course though. So it's a long course, particularly in remote communities where dogs are free roaming, people live chaotic lives. Compliance around a 28 day doxy course is really challenging. And so even if it happens that the vets are in the community at the time that the dog is in the acute phase, uh, the likelihood that that dog's gonna receive effective treatment is pretty low. So most dogs in remote communities are not unfortunately receiving treatment. Some dogs will recover naturally without treatment anyway, but what we've tended to see in communities, bearing in mind that community dogs have a whole, whole host of health threats, you know, there's parvo, there's anaplasma, there's babesia, uh, there's lots of GI worms, there's, there's lots of comorbidities happening, but we've seen in some communities up to 30% of the dogs perish at that acute phase. And particularly in the, the summer of 2020, 2021, we saw this disease moving through communities in, in acute waves essentially. You could almost track it house to house. You know, these are communities where tick populations are huge, where parasite control is often suboptimal to, to say the least. Um, and the dogs, as I said, you know, they've often got um, uh, lots of other comorbidities, so they're often immunocompromised already. And so we've, we've really seen significant impacts. The trouble with the disease though is that it doesn't end there. So what can happen if that dog, if it survives the acute phase, they can either recover or they can enter this subclinical phase. And during that subclinical phase, the, the bacteria goes off and sequesters, usually in the, the bone marrow or the spleen. And so that means that the dog can still have the bacteria in their system, but they'll be PCR negative. Uh, then you're not going to pick it up on bloods at that time. You, you, you might get serology depending on when you're sampling in relation to the time of the infection. Um, but confirming that a dog has actually recovered is almost impossible. You can't guarantee that, that that bacteria hasn't gone off and sequestered somewhere. So even dogs that have been treated, their owners need to be warned that their dog could still develop chronic uh, the chronic symptoms at some point down the track. When that's to occur, who's to say? Uh, it can be months, it can be years. And unfortunately, once they do hit that, that chronic phase, it's usually terminal. By then, the bone marrow has usually been destroyed and those, there's very little that can be done even in the gold standard specialist hospitals to bring those dogs back. So what we've seen in communities, um, really high estimated prevalences. There's not been actual prevalence data done, um, but certainly based on clinical signs, we, in, in particularly those top end communities where brown dog ticks are just prolific, um, we, we, we would have estimated that, particularly in that summer, that initial summer, that up to 100% of the dogs in those communities were infected. We saw mortalities between 10 and 30%. There's certainly been comorbidities reported. So some of the tests have come back that it also had parvo, it also had anaplasma, it also had babesia. So um, that is potentially contributing to that, but it could also be that we maybe have a, a, a more pathogenic version of Ecanus here than elsewhere in the world, or it might just be that our dogs are so naive to it um, that, the, 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 that they just haven't developed any sort of immunity. Um, interesting little symbol there, but the, the chronic cases, um, certainly when it first hit, we had real concerns that this could potentially turn into an animal welfare crisis, which 
in and of itself is terribly concerning. But for remote communities that already receive a bad rap for the care and management of their animals, that's a major PR crisis. Because what we anticipated is if the, uh, if the chronic cases emerge in the same sort of pattern as we'd seen with the acute cases, we would see whole communities of emaciated, sickly dogs. Um, and of course, that's not as a result of neglect. Uh, but rather a pathological issue that's occurring with those dogs. However, the grey nomad that's driving past isn't going to recognise that. Um, so we, we certainly had a lot of discussions early on with uh, different animal welfare authorities and organisations, really highlighting that this has the potential to have big PR type ramifications and that we want you on board to back us up that this isn't uh, the fault of the communities. Fortunately, we haven't seen the, the waves of chronic cases emerge in, the, in that sort of intensity like we did the acute cases. Uh, but there are certainly you know, the odd few cases in every community that we visit now that are, are mo more than likely chronic alikia cases. So in terms of the impacts then for people, I think it's easy when we're talking about dog populations to forget that those, those populations are made up of individual animals. And of course those individual animals have significant meaning, they might be a child's confidant, they might be a, a family's protector. Um, you know, they, they can give people that, the loyalty and security that we all know that dogs give us. And so for people experiencing the mortality rates that we saw, the morbidity rates that we saw, this was a really significant event and continues to be a significant event. There was, you know, some families, they had five dogs and four of them died when the acute waves moved through. Um, so it's, it's been significant from a mental health point of view. Um, there's also been a concern around public health risks with the disposal of carcasses when lots of dogs are dying in those sort of numbers. And of course for the veterinary community, you know, there's, um, there's fewer than 20 vets who are routinely delivering these sort of services in remote communities. And so for them to be seeing this consistently in every community that they're visiting with really very little that they can do to prevent it um, was really impactful for their mental health as well. And so this slide has 10 animals. In, in the acute phase, in that initial wave, we were seeing three in every 10 dogs die. So which, which three is it, you know? Is it um, Missy and, and uh, Roberta's dog up there? Is it Robert and Rocky? Or is it Frank's dogs here at Man and Greta? It's, you know, these are people's pets. They have cultural meaning as well. Um, yes, they're camp dogs, but that doesn't mean they're not, they're not valued. Uh, so I think it's really important to, to recognise that whilst they have a different management system than we're used to in, in urban, metropolitan and, and regional areas, um, these dogs are really still important to people and, and do provide a huge amount of cultural and, and social value. And I think particularly around emergency animal disease responses then, that's a real challenge in that, that companion animals serve these roles that we all, we all have this value for these animals, but we can't put an economic value on it. And when our emergency animal disease structures are built around economy and trade, uh, it's really then challenging to make sure that we're effectively responding to events like this that, that don't necessarily have economic consequences but still have significant social and cultural consequences. Um, so we've been really busy over the last three years doing a lot of work around Alikia Canis. Um, it's the silver lining of this event, I think, has that it, it has raised the profile of both AMRIC but also the need in remote communities. Um, things like the pharmaceutical companies have taken a much greater interest since Ecanis arrived and so we've been fortunate to receive a lot more donations and support from them. Um, I think the, there's been a lot of people working in the departments that maybe hadn't realised that this work occurred or that the, the need was there who are now aware of this work and certainly supportive of it. Um, and so I'm not going to go through all these in detail, but we, you know, we did a lot of work in the advocacy space. We've done a lot of work developing a wide variety of educational resources. Um, and then of course we've done a, a lot of direct animal health service delivery as well. Um, and you know, those things will continue, they, they need to continue. Um, and the work in communities will never be done. But certainly one of the things that we've learnt from this outbreak is that Remote communities are unique and it's not, not necessarily a learning, it's more a realisation. You know, we've got unique geography, we've got unique climates, culture, um, and all of these things impact the rollout of emergency animal disease responses. Uh, we need to make sure that we're tailoring our emergency animal disease responses to these complexities. 
in some jurisdictions, not New South Wales, um, I don't know New South Wales legislation in enough detail, but in some other jurisdictions there are some legislative gaps that need to be addressed in terms of companion animal management in emergency animal diseases. Um, you know, they basically, where there's a livestock act, they would have to have designated the dogs as a livestock species in order to be able to put movement controls and things on them. So, you know, in terms of rabies preparedness, that's a clear and obvious gap that we need to address. We still don't know enough about the One Health impacts of these outbreaks. Um, so early on in the outbreak, we commissioned Peter Irwin to do a lit review looking at the zoonotic potential of Ecanus. Given that we're working in communities that often have high health chronic burdens, um, that are in areas where parasites are really prolific and brown dog ticks are everywhere, that have suboptimal parasite control, any community um, that is going to get E. canis as a zoonosis, it's going to be remote indigenous communities. So uh, Peter Irwin did the lit review. He, he discovered that there's been, I think, fewer than a dozen, but a handful of cases out of southern and central America where E. canis has been detected in people who've presented to hospital with tick-borne disease type symptoms. It would seem that the southern central America lineage of E. canis is distinct. Um, and there's been subsequent work done on the Australian E. canis lineage and it seems, there's not many published genomes for E. canis globally, um, but it seems that it's most closely related to the Southeast Asian strain, makes sense. Um, however, what we don't know is how much screening is happening in Southeast Asia in terms of zoonotic potential. There are only two research groups globally that are really interested in E. canis. Um, so it, 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 it's not that we can't rule it out at this point. Um, it's probably uh, unlikely, but certainly for remote communities who do suffer such strong and high health burdens, um, it's something that we continue to be concerned about. Certainly the, uh, the investment in biosecurity has increased. Um, of course, concurrently to Ecanus, we had COVID, but then we had FMD, we had LSD, we had all these events happening in parallel. And so there's been big investment in biosecurity structures and systems, and that's wonderful. Um, but we do need to make sure that that trickles down to remote communities as well, and that we're building capacity at a local level in communities. Um, we are fortunate um, to have a biosecurity pilot project that is speaking to that this is um, a picture of us working in the Torres with the environmental health workers up there. Um, and so our project officer, Helen, who's the blonde head that you can see in the bottom of the corner, um, she is a vet nurse as well. So she's been working with the, the, the environmental health workers there, doing that work to deliver antiparasitic treatments, animal health assessments, uh, but also collect census data for each of the communities. So that's really useful, important data for, for future emergency animal disease preparedness in that we know within that community, how many animals they, there are, who owns them, where they're distributed throughout that community. Um, but it's, it's also helping to build that local capacity. So we're delivering annual training with these guys, helping them to recognise signs of unusual disease, unusual symptoms, and make sure that they know the avenues through which they can report that. Uh, this is a project that's funded by the Department of Agriculture uh, and we're working across six regions, so two in Queensland, two in NT and two in WA, using the AMRIC app. Um, and we're really hoping, um, we're working really closely with NARCS, the Northern Australian Quarantine Service, on this project. And what we're hoping is that this project, hopefully, or this model, can become the new model for companion animal uh, biosecurity surveillance in remote communities. So the censuses are a big part of that work. And um, it's, it's something that we're doing both within that biosecurity project, but more broadly as part of that strategic advice service that we offer. And so to do that, we visit every house in the community. We're out going door to door. We're always working with a local liaison, as I said earlier. Um, and we're making sure that the community receives a tangible and immediate benefit through the provision of antiparasitic treatments for their animals. This, of course, means that we're improving the, the health and biosecurity knowledge of the people that we're working with, but also the community members that we're having those conversations with. Um, it's it improving the health of the animals in those communities and allowing us to detect any abnormalities that are, are present. Um, but really importantly, it, it sticks to the mantra of no survey without service, which is really important for remote communities. For a long time, they've had a lot of research projects in particular come in, take data, and they've never been heard from since. Um, so there really does need to be that really obvious and tangible benefit for communities to be, to be participating in these sort of biosecurity surveillance systems. 
So our app is the tool that we use to collect that data. Um, it's a custom designed app that we've uh, had in development over many years now, but essentially we have an animal record to which we can add details of signalment, health indicators, etc. Um, and we can add to those over time as well. So in some regions where we've got vet services providers routinely using the app, we've got, you know, a eight year history on this particular dog, which is really lovely to see. And the community members themselves love it as well, because you bring up a photo of when that dog was a puppy and they're just like, oh my goodness. Um, so then the animal record sits within a house record, which sits within a community, which sits within a region. We can move animals between houses as well and sort of link them to multiple houses if we need to. We've designed the app to be really visual and require minimal text input. We're working with uh, community members for whom, as I said earlier, English is not their first language. Um, you know, one of the animal management workers, for example, that I was working with in Arnhem Land a few years back, his, his English language skills and literacy skills uh, were to the point that he had to get his driver's license out to be able to spell his name. So these are people who we cannot expect to be recording information if they're having to, to write things and type things. Um, so lots of visual indicators, lots of checkboxes instead is really important. We're collecting basic uh, signalment information, of course, about these animals and we, we um, have lots of different training resources. Again, our fabulous graphic designer. We've realised that people vary in height, but bins do not. Although there are a few different sizes of bins, but in community, <laughs> in community, generally they're all the same larger size bin, and so we now are using bins as our, our our guide for sizing. You know, it just helps people to position it in relation to something that's consistent, um, and of course they need to know the sizing in order to be able to choose the appropriate size of antiparasitics. It would be really nice if the pharmaceuticals all got together and decided on the same size ranges for each of the antiparasitics, because uh, that's a bit of a challenge, but um, nevertheless we can use these sort of resources to help um, you know, build knowledge around which, which size to select and we always colour code it as well. Um, of course we're also capturing animal health indicators, so we use body condition scores, skin scores to be able to aggregate that data up to a population level. We're recording problems and clinical signs um, and this is just a demonstration but when you move these sliders th those pictures will change so you can um, you get a visual prompt as to which selection you're making. So what do we then do with that data? Um, it, it, obviously we can use it for, for veterinary clinical records at an individual level but really the, the power in that data comes when we start to aggregate it and start to look at it at a community level or a regional level. Um, and so this is just an example from one of the communities where we had done a couple of censuses in a period between uh, in which COVID had hit and so this community had received very little in terms of access to veterinary services. Most communities locked down during the COVID period uh, at a minimum for three months. Um, but often longer. And so this particular community, unfortunately, like many communities we're seeing across the top end, has seen a huge jump in cat numbers. Um, I think, unfortunately, cat populations and their increases might be an unintended consequence of improved dog management over many years, uh, in that 20, 30 years ago, you wouldn't see a cat in a community. Uh, and now we see them quite happily sitting and playing out on the road with the dogs. So I, I, it's a big challenge for us. It's the next, you know, the next big thing that we need to address. Um, and they are much harder to deal with than dogs. <laughs> we can handle most dogs. We're going to communities um, where you know, some houses have 20 or 30 cats living in the house. They've basically formed a colony, and which is, is what we see in the data here as well, in that we're seeing you know, predominantly females recorded at the households. Doesn't mean the males don't exist, but they're probably out on the periphery rather than in the community itself. Um, but to catch a house of 20 or 30 cats that are very seldom handled, often living in the roof cavity, um, is a real challenge. And so it requires us to be setting up traps and that means more time and going back to that house time and time again. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that we haven't, haven't yet worked out exactly how we can do it as efficiently as possible, but we're trying lots of different options and if anyone has ideas, please let us know because it's an ever-increasing challenge. You can see the dissecting rate in this community was not great and so those cats are of course exploding. 
Uh, we aim for a dissection rate between 70 and 90 percent for cat populations and so there's a long way to go there. But at least by having this data we know that we need to dissect between 160 and 200 cats in that community. That means we can start to plan on how many days of service that we're going to be there and what that's going to cost the community in terms of getting access to that services. Um, what, what that's going to cost in terms of environmental impacts and you know we can use this data to then take it to the Threatened Species Commissioner for example and advocate to them that look you know this is just one community this is happening everywhere we need your support to be able to address this. So the data itself has really a wide variety of uses. Um, another example here our One Health Research coordinator Dr Jess Hoops has done an analysis of the antiparasitic treatments recorded in the AMRIC app over the last decade or so. Um, and you can see here, which is, is heavily influenced by the Ecanis outbreak, I should add, a big drop suddenly in the use of off-label ivermectin, which of course is cheap um, and has been the, the, the go-to for many, many years in communities. But suddenly we see an uptick in things like Revecto and Nexgard and other pharmaceutical products thanks to the pharmaceutical support that we started receiving. Um, however, what, what we can then do with this data is start to think about, well, what does this mean in terms of One Health impacts? You know, we are blanket dosing whole communities at, at once. So ivermectin, for example, is a second line treatment for humans for scabies. So if we're out there doling it around to dogs, are we promoting resistance, which then has an impact on the human scabies treatments? Um, equally, you know, we're, we're giving a lot of Brevecto all at once to these dogs and communities. What does that mean in terms of envir environmental impacts? These dogs are often swimming down in the local creek and are there little yabbies and crustacea down there that we're then disrupting as a result of the antiparasitics that we're mass administering. So there's, it, the more we look into the data, the more questions we have, um, but it's certainly very powerful and important to be capturing. Um, most importantly though, the app is useful for community members themselves. So helping them to collect the information that they're interested in. Um, it's, as I said, highly visual, helps them to be able to use it and, and engage with it. Most of the people that we work with, they pick it up within a day and they're flying. Um, of course, connectivity is a big challenge in a lot of the places that we work. So it does work offline and can be synced up to a central database at a later date. Uh, so that's been really important too. We really believe that the benefits of companion animal management in communities go far beyond the animals themselves. You know, these are benefits for the community as, as a group of people, uh, as, a, as a social group, as a cultural group, uh, but also the local environment for the, the different wildlife species in that region. We also recognise that there are in, enormous biosecurity benefits to regular veterinary service and animal health service provision in communities. And in fact, where those services are not occurring, that's a major biosecurity threat particularly given the proximity of a lot of these communities to our northern neighbours as well. So, to take home, I think it's really important and hopefully I've given you um, a, a deeper understanding, I guess, of the, the impact that social and cultural determinants can have, not only on people, but also on the animals that they're caring for. Um, I think it's really important to recognise that our animals are part of a system and a part of a community, that they don't exist in isolation and so all those factors that impact the health of people also impact the health of animals too. Alicia canis will continue to be a major issue in remote communities until, hopefully, maybe one day we have enough resourcing to have effective year-round antiparasitic provision to these communities. Uh, but until then we'll continue to see significant morbidity and mortality for dogs in communities. And of course, that really has shown us just how significant the, the social and cultural value of animals are and how important it is that we start to consider those social and cultural values within emergency animal disease responses. We essentially need, we, we need ways of measuring the value of those things um, in order to be able to justify that there are significant impacts beyond ec economic and trade consequences too. And of course, all of us, vets, play a really important role in monitoring for emergency animal diseases. But I think from my experience, I would say that you also play a really important role in advocating for the needs of your own clients. You know, whether it's a, a literacy need and the fact that the pamphlet that's being produced is not appropriate language, or whether it's a realisation that to get the samples back to the lab is going to cost you as a veterinarian or the client, you know, an $800 courier fee, so no one's going to pay it. You know, these are all things that, that we can start to advocate um, and, and help to make sure that our emergency animal disease structure are as strong as they possibly can be. 
thanks very much. If you want to get in touch, I'm happy to chat. Um, I'm not coming today, unfortunately. Um, so if you do want to catch me, catch me now. But uh, if you want to send me an email at any point, I'm happy to chat as well. Thank you.